everybody, I don't know about you, but as you've watched out over the world, the war in uh, Russia and Ukraine is not just isolated to Eastern Europe. It's spread all over the world, and you can see it in market instabilities. You can see it here. People who do not think that that war is affecting you, all you got to do is look at gas prices. You look at uh, your food prices. You see the, the global uh, change that has happened. But you know something that's also affected investments as well. And I've said all along, Legacy Precious Metals is your navigator. They're the ones that see you through to get to the next level. The good news about this is even with market volatility, market instability, you've got uh, options. And gold prices are rising as investors turn to gold. And gold presents a hedge against this inflation and that protects you uh, against the weakening dollar, which we are seeing. Legacy Precious Metals is the only company I trust to deal with gold and silver and the other precious metals. You need this investment. You need this as part of your portfolio to keep you buffered from what we're seeing in the world. War and, and, and volatility in the market. This is where you need to be. Uh, call Legacy Precious Metals today. Uh, be proactive about this. Get on board with it. Call them at 866-528-1900. 866-528-1903. Or you can download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com, your navigator in a volatile world of investments. Do you want to listen to a podcast? By who? Georgia GOP Congressman Doug Collins. How, how is it? The greatest thing I have ever heard in my whole life. I could not believe my ears. In this house, wherever the rules are disregarded, chaos and mob rule. It has been said today, where is bravery? I'll tell you where bravery is found and courage is found. It's found in this minority who has lived through the last year of nothing but rules being broken, people being put down, questions not being answered, and this majority say, be damned with anything else. We're going to impeach and do whatever we want to do. Why? Because we won an election. I guarantee you, one day you'll be back in the minority and it ain't going to be that fun. Hey everybody, it's Doug Collins. Glad to have you back here on the Doug Collins Podcast. It's always a joy when I get to go back and, and have uh, time to spend with some old friends. And today is uh, is really one of those special days. I get to go, we get to have a time of chatting with a, a good friend of mine from Alabama, Mike Rogers. He's uh, uh, I, the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, well be the chair, uh, I, you know, come November with everything going like it should. But Mike and I go uh, a lot further back, and Mike has put a lot of thought. He's one of the more thoughtful members of Congress, not only in legislation, but also in, uh, in ideas, but also in making sure that an individual member's voices are heard. And that's uh, something we may talk about a little bit in the, the archaic work of the, uh, the different conferences, Republican conferences in the House and the Democratic conference, is how members get put into leadership positions. And one of the things that Mike always pushed for was that leadership positions should go to where the most votes are actually represented. And Mike did a great job of that, working with other uh, legislators, especially from the South, to make sure that the leadership voices at the table uh, reflected our party. And Mike has done a great job of that. So, folks, I want you to uh, welcome to the Doug Collins Podcast, Mike Rogers from Alabama. Mike, it's good to see you, buddy. Thank you, Doug. We miss you, man. <laughs> well, I miss, uh, miss being there. A lot of, a lot of uh, late night uh, sessions and discussions and everything as we go. Mike, one of the things that I always like to talk about when we get started on the podcast is, and from a perspective, everybody seems to know us, even if it's back in our districts and uh, states, they know us from things like this. They see us on TV, they see us on, or hear us on radio. They do that. They don't really know like sort of how we got to where we are. So I want to use this moment before we get into some the deeper stuff in Washington, talk a little bit about how you got to Congress, sort of your background, why you wanted to do this in the first place. Well, I started young. I, I knew from an, uh, as an adolescent, I wanted to, to, to be in Congress. Uh, and I started to prepare myself for a career in public service. I, I, uh, uh, I, I, prepared for, for law. I tell people that, that law is my vocation, politics is my career, um, but I prepared for a career in politics by getting an uh, undergraduate degree in political science, a master's degree in public administration and a law degree. And um, then at 28, ran for the state, uh, for the county commission in my home county, was the youngest person ever elected in the first Republican. Like a lot in the South, you know, there's, there was a, uh, the South is very conservative, but it was always historically Democrat until the last uh, three decades. Ronald Reagan had a lot to do with changing that, and then Barack Obama kind of capped it off. Uh, but in any event, then I went from the county commission uh, to the state legislature, was there uh, two terms, served as minority leader, and then 2008, I ran for the House, uh, 2002, I ran for the House. I've been here ever since. 
when I see that there's some, can, can we jump off something here? Cause Mike, you'll be amazed at how many people I get. I know you do as well, but especially me being out of office, I have people come to me talking about, Oh, I want to run for this, or I want to run for that. And we've got some races even here in Georgia in which they're good young people who, you know, you want to see involved in public life, but they think that they have to go to the sort of to the top first. I love how you talked about going. You start at the county commission level. There's a there, there's several that I can think of right now. They're running for Congress. They're going to get beat. It's not going to be close. And either they'll you know probably just you know they not run again, or if they do, they have that one loss. It's just a a bad experience. Explain to I can do it, but I'd love to also have you do it from Alabama's perspective. The the perspective of the these are offices like county commissioner, city council, DA, judges. These are offices that really, in many ways, touch people closer than what you and I did in Congress. That's exactly right. I, in fact, I, I did an editorial when I was in the legislature as minority leader for, I think it was the Retailers Magazine. And I talked about that, that local elected officials have much more of a daily impact on their constituents than we do, their daily lives. You know, if that water's not working or the potholes aren't fixed or the trash not being picked up, they know it right then and it has immediate impact in their life until it's corrected. Uh, but, I, you know, it's, it's been a frustration for me that, that so many people think that they just ought to jump into politics and go straight to Congress. And I just don't think that's the way to do it. And I have people, I, you know, I'm, I've been in this business now for over 35 years. And I've had a lot of people ask me, what's my advice to somebody who wants to get in this business? And I tell them, first of all, volunteer in campaigns. It doesn't matter if it's a city council campaign, a county commission, a governor's president, whatever, Congress. See the mechanics of how people get elected to public policy positions. It helps you understand the basis of everything. And then if you want to get in public office, start local. At, you need to understand the fundamentals of how to make legislation, whether you're talking about at the city council level, county, state, before you come to Congress. And, uh, and that is my best advice. You know, I, I learned a lot as a 28 year old county commissioner about the things not to do. <laughs> and the same thing in the legislature. You know, one of the problems, as you know, that we encountered up here you know, when you were here and the whole time I've been here is a lot of people who did get elected right into Congress and they have no idea how the legislative process works. And it takes them a long time to ever get comfortable with it, if they ever do. Some of them just have to leave. <laughs> they just can't take it. Well, Mike, I, I see something else in that regard. I see them when they get there. Again, you see some of the comments. It, it, and I love your, I'm glad you gave your background. You have a master's, you have you know undergrad, you have a master's, you have a law degree. You know, I have a, I have a divinity degree and a law degree. It, it just, but there's, there, and spent time in the state legislature. There is this idea, and this is, you know, you and me sort of talking about this, and we've talked about this in, in different capabilities before. There's this idea that Congress is easy, that it's just go up there and vote, do the Constitution. You've heard it. You know, we, you know, and, and I'm not making fun of that necessarily, but have we allowed ourselves as politicians, and I'm going to say politicians, I'm going to say that in a, in a way of, of, of truth, to uh, to let people believe that legislating and getting things accomplished is easy. And that if you don't get it, that you somehow sold out. Have, have we, have we let that happen a little bit? I don't think we let it happen. I think it's easy for social media and cable television to characterize it that way. The fact is anybody that's been in this business, any length of time knows it's really, really hard to legislate. And in fact, that's the way our four founders uh, intended it to be. It's not supposed to be easy to make laws. And it's, we're supposed to fuss and not get along as we try to, to, to create that friction that makes laws. And you can look at the history of our country as the best evidence of that. Uh, the first Continental Congress collapsed, the second one did. Finally, when our forefathers did kind of come together and come up with the Declaration and then the Constitution, they fought like cats and dogs. I mean, some of them tried to leave and they had to be brought back. And then you look at the great moments in our history, you know, whether it's the 13th Amendment, the 16th Amendment, whatever, up, up until more, more recently, the Civil Rights Movement. Those have been vicious periods of time, but they were dealing with stuff that was significant. You know, one of the things you and I dealt with was the uh, 
Obamacare when you were the government was trying to take over health insurance. That was very personal to people. It mattered to them, and it was supposed to be hard to do things like that because it affects people. So, you know, I say all that to say, you know, this is not supposed to be easy because if it is, we'd be, we'd be regulated and lawed to death. Uh, it's supposed to be hard because what we do really does have a, a big effect on people, and it's supposed to take, take time and, and, and not be pretty. Uh, the only difference between now and all those t- periods I just described is, uh, let's say back when it was the 16th Amendment. You know, people read about that two or three weeks later if they got a newspaper and if they could read. Now, cable television's playing it live with commentary. Social media is, is spinning it live with commentary. So it's in everybody's face, but there's nothing different about what we're doing now uh, with legislation uh, that really is impactful to people than what we've always done. It's just, it's, it's in people's face now. Well, it's different. And one of the things, Mike, that, that we've talked about, and, and I think going forward here, that I, that I think affects your work as leadership in, in House Armed Services Committee, and it did Homeland, it did in, in a lot of different ways, is the idea that you can get things done and not lose you know, the fact that you're a conservative, not lose the fact that you have conservative principles. And, and, and also, in fairness, that the liberal side of the house, they can get things done without you know, finding ways to lose their liberalism, if you would. But but at the end of the day, it's about getting things done. And I think that's the one thing that, you know, for all the folks who go back and, and quote our forefathers, I wish that they would spend a little bit more time looking at that, at the, that hot room in Philadelphia and look at what you talked about. You know, they were walking out, they wanted to leave, but yet they got in there and fought with each other to get something that they could live with that, at the end of the day, didn't feel like they gave up who they were to get there. Um, and, and somebody asked me the other day, and I, it was just sort of an off-the-wall question. They say, is there any way to get stuff done in Congress anymore? And I said, well, there is, but I'm afraid the day of the big thing, Mike, and I'd love to hear your comment on the day of the big item. The, and you've got one, and I want to talk about Space Force here in just a little bit. But those days when, like, we did criminal justice reform, we did other things. Those days are a little bit gone right now because there's been such a polarization that unless it's my idea and our idea, it's not going to work and you have to come to me. Are you still seeing that in Congress? Yeah, I, I'm of the opinion we only do big things when it's a crisis point and everybody, the crisis outweighs the, the partisan positioning that's taking place up here. Um, but we still get big stuff done. I mean, whether you like it or not, Obamacare was a big, big thing. And it's still the law, whether I like it or not. You know, that was a heavy lift. And, and Nancy Pelosi, it cost her the majority, but she would argue it was worth it because it is still law today. Uh, and that, it's unfortunate that it takes a crisis for us to get big stuff done. But when there is a crisis, we find a way. You look at right now with uh, what we, well, two things I would offer, example, the pandemic brought us together and we did some pretty serious heavy lifting to save the economy in the first year of the pandemic. Now in the second year, things got partisan and all of a sudden it was just a spin fest, but um, there wouldn't have been an economy to bring back if we hadn't come together as a nation in that first year, those first two relief bills. And uh, and then you look at what's happening in, in Ukraine right now, that has massive worldwide uh, implications. And we came together uh, in a bipartisan fashion to, to react to this as a country. And, uh, and I think it's going to make the difference in, in uh, whether or not Ukraine wins, and I do believe they will win, and, and have a chilling effect on what China w- could be thinking about doing with regard to Taiwan. But, you know, those were big crises that caused us to come together and act. Exactly. It's sort of interesting right now. Um, I am uh, in... As, as you know, I'm still in the Air Force and I just crossed my 20 year mark and I'm having to do what's called Air War College right now, actually based out of Montgomery, the our Air University down there. But um, in some of the same things you're talking about is stuff that we're discussing right now in the social media realm around the Ukraine, the mass persuasion issues that you see with Russia, China and others. So let's let's this is a great segue into where there are a couple of committees on Capitol Hill that if there is a place that you could say breeds some sense of bipartisanship, 
It's the Ag Committee and the Armed Services Committee. And really because of where they were. Now, I would know nothing of that because I was on judiciary, oversight, rules. <laughs> I didn't know anything about that in my committees. But yours does. Are you First off, let me just say this. Are you cons- Is that feeling still there, even though Armed Services is a very large committee? Or do you see some of the divisiveness coming up even in, in that committee now? Not in armed services. We're, we're very bipartisan and, we're, and we guard that jealously, no matter who's in, in the majority. Uh, ag, unfortunately, as you know, I was on ag for 14 years. I, I had to, to get off of it as I've taken this position. Uh, ag, ag has even been polluted with partisanship lately. I would say that the only other committee that's, that's somewhat bipartisan is appropriations, but, but they're struggling. But now armed services, I'm proud to say, uh, the Democrat leadership in charge of armed services right now has treated us splendidly. And when I'm chairman next year, I'm going to treat them the same way. We are not going to let the partisanship of this place pollute our committee. We're going to put what's in the best interest of our national security ahead of everything. Now, having said that, we have some things we fuss about. And we, we fuss about you know n- nuclear weapons, and we fuss about Gitmo, and whether or not we're going to pay for transgender you know, transitions and stuff like that. But when you take the things that we fuss and bicker about, it's 5% maybe of the issues. 95% is just about what's best for the future of this country. And, uh, and it's, it's refreshing to go into our committee and treat each other civilly and work in a productive fashion. And, and Mike, that is good to hear. And I think people need to hear that. One of the things that is, is someone who serves and also still hears a lot of, of concern has it been a concern to you, and, and it may or may not be in different capacities, but the leadership at DOD now has tended to follow the Biden sort of move into more social awareness uh, issues, especially, um, you know, last year when we had to stand down for uh, the relationship, however you want to put it. Has that gotten better? Was that a reaction in the first year we're in office and we're going to do this? Or have you seen that continuing? It's continuing. It's unfortunate. You know, people, people, I think, know that elections have consequences. I don't think what people realize is how much power the executive branch has when it comes to administering day-to-day activities of the various departments. And the, the Department of Defense is the largest department in the government. And whether we like it or not, the president gets to dictate to the uh, the secretary of defense those kind of things that he wants attention paid to, and then uh, we we do our best to try to channel it and and keep it from getting out, out of out of bounds. But it continues to be a, a problem that makes service in the military more difficult for a lot of great Americans who just want to protect their country. They don't want to be indoctrinated. Exactly. One of the things the Armed Services Committee does, and for my listeners out there on this podcast, I like to teach in this podcast a great deal about what goes on because a lot of times they only see the headlines, they only see the tweets, they only see that. And one thing that is the big deal with Armed Services Committee every year, and it's a point of pride that is passed, and you'll be able to tell me the exact number of years it's passed, is the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, which sets the policy in many ways for what the military operates under and sets the budget limitations as well. Um, you're getting ready for that uh, again here in the next, I'm assuming probably within the next six weeks, eight weeks is you look at that. Explain to people really what that process is and then how your committee uniquely does what is known as the markup or the preparation of that bill. Yeah. The, the NDAA is basically what tells, it tells the Pentagon what they can and can't do for the next year in a nutshell. And, um, uh, we started in January with what we call posture hearings, uh, where we have each one of the departments come up and tell me you know, what they think about the president's budget, what their concerns are, what they think they're going to need, not need, and we, we question them. Uh, we just finished the last posture hearing last week, uh, and we will go in and mark up the, the National Defense Authorization Act in committee on June 22nd. And uh, we try our best, and we'll, there'll be, it'll take 18 to 20 hours to mark it up. And uh, then at the end of that, we try to have a unanimous vote in support of it coming out of committee, even though some amendments will get in it that some of us don't like. We'd like to send a message to the troops and to the American people that 
regardless of its flaws, it's still the best we can do. And we generally do get a unanimous vote or near unanimous vote coming out of committee. Then as you know, it goes to the floor and uh, all kind of crazy amendments are offered. Uh, some get on there, some don't. Uh, it's a long, painful process. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, your, your listeners would be interested in this, and that, that is knowing that because this is the only bill that for sure passes every year, and we've done it for 61 years, People want to attach their amendment, whether it's related to military or not, to our bill. They want to hitch to our wagon because they know our wagon's going to become law. So they put, they try to put a lot of stuff on there, and uh, and a lot of it gets on there. But then, as you know, you know the Senate passes their version, and they're never the same. So they go into conference committee, and conference committee is where we take out the superfluous stuff that really doesn't have anything to do with the bill and and get it to a point where we're certain both chambers can pass it and become law. And you're right, once that's done, once we've authorized what can be done, then the appropriators take what we've done in our top line and try to see how much, if not all of that, they can actually fund. Exactly. Well, it's interesting, you brought up something called a conference committee. It's amazing, my, you and I, even in my time there over you know eight years and yours a little bit longer, it's amazing how we've, except for really the NDAA and maybe every three or four years, the Ag Bill, a conference committee has become a, uh, in many ways, a dinosaur in the House. And for those out there listening, Mike did a great job explaining that. It takes the Senate version of the bill, you take the House version of the bill, and then you put conference committee members, literally senators and House members, into a room, and they then you know sort of hammer out what the bill should look like. Shouldn't really, I mean, from your background in you know, you know, political science and in masters and stuff, isn't that the way we should be doing this? And that that really the country is at a loss that we're not doing more uh, of the true what we'll call regular order conference committees and bills like that. Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, you know, you were in leadership when you were here. We had our leadership retreat in Miami about six weeks ago. And it was all in preparation for what we're going to do when we take over in, in, in January of next year, because we feel very confident we're going to take the majority and we want to hit the ground running. And the one thing that was the most important that was emphasized is we got to get back to regular order where we write bills in committee, we authorize in other committees and appropriate on time. You know, Doug, one of my big frustrations this past year, we were on the floor defending the mark. And I had the chairman of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee get up and said, listen, I'm gonna support this mark, but I want y'all to know how frustrated I am that it's been 21 years since we reauthorized the State Department. And that's just wrong. Well, it's embarrassing is what it is. We are the only committee that does an authorization bill every year. When I got here in 2002, we regularly authorized across different departments and we got appropriations bills done each year. Around 2008, 2009 is when it came off the track. And now this place, all we've done is cede the authority to the executive branch because we're not authorizing every year or telling them what they can and can't do. So that's what we got to get back to where every standing committee, like you were on judiciary, we ought to be authorizing the Department of Justice every year, telling them what they can and can't do. But, you know, we, we got to get back to it. And the good news is that is our top priority at the new majority is to get back to, to legislating and do it our oversight. Hey, great. I, and that's what it's got to be. Look, as a ranking member of judiciary, one of the things that I found out, no one could actually tell me. And we looked at this when the Ju- Department of Justice as a whole had actually went through an o- authorization process. That, that we, we don't honestly know. We think it's probably 200, almost could be as old as 170, 200 years that it's actually went through step by step saying, is this what we want the Department of Justice actually doing? And I think people think we do that all the time. And the reality is we don't. Uh, Congress has gave up a lot of its ability uh, to do that over the over the last little bit. Um, I want to give you I do want to give you a chance just before we get gone here. You are one of the driving forces behind Space Force. Uh, President Trump took a lot of credit for that. You, though, I watched you in rules. I was there with you in rules. We got this thing done. Um, for those who are looking at it from a distance, how has so far has that played out? I know from my Air Force perspective, we're still learning about our airmen and our guardians and everybody getting together. 
how do you see it playing out right now, Mike, as you had envisioned it? It's coming along just like we, what we wanted. The The thing that I want your listeners to understand is this is not about sending Captain Kirk to, to space. This is about satellites and how heavily dependent we are on satellites in our day-to-day lives. But, but more recently, uh, our military has become enormously dependent on satellites. There, that's our eyes and ears in space and sometimes our, our uh, voice. Uh, you know, people think about, for example, the GPS satellite constellation. That's not up there to help you find a restaurant or, or get direction somewhere. We let you use it because you paid for it, but it's a military constellation. We put that up there to guide our missiles, and position our troops, and a whole host of things militarily. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of other constellations. Well, the problem is Russia and China figured out while they can't really compete with us in a terrestrial war, a tactical war, if they could take our eyes and ears out, then they might actually have a chance of, of, of degrading our capability enough to hurt us. Well, once we realized that we had allowed them to catch up with us in space, we couldn't, we couldn't just let that pass because they were about to surpass us. So basically we took the space mission out of the air force to give it a separate budget, a separate department where they can develop their own culture for space dominance. As you know, in the Air Force, it's all about air dominance. You are culturally indoctrinated from the time you get there that you are to get and maintain air dominance. We needed that same culture for space, which is now a warfighting domain. China had already set up a space force and, uh, and it's done. We're moving it at the clip that we want to move at. Uh, it, the thing that people need to understand is when we set it up, we set up the bare bones, the skeleton, on purpose. A, it was politically hard enough to do just that, but we wanted to layer on other capabilities and, and p- components as each year passes by so that we're not going too fast that we mess up. And uh, this year we're going to add, uh, or this coming year, we're going to add the reserve component. Uh, but it's coming along nicely. I said from the beginning, this was going to be a five or six year process to get it up to kind of the, the full Christmas tree with lights and ornaments and everything. And, and I'm very pleased with it. The thing that I'm uh, the most concerned about is making sure the bu- bureaucracy that, that burdened it in the Air Force does not creep back into it. When it comes to satellite technology, it moves so rapidly that the, the people in procurement acquisitions have to be able to make fast decisions to get the technology to stay up with the times and uh and they're doing it so i'm pretty pleased with it and uh I, i'm you know i know president trump did try to take credit for it he was a big partner but it wasn't his idea <laughs> as you know we passed it out of the house a year before he'd ever heard of it yeah well, and it makes it in but it was it's always good to have a big backer especially at 1600 pennsylvania to actually to keep it going hey uh, one of the things i want to look at before i let you go i, c- I can't uh, nod this you've talked a lot about the house flipping back to the republicans which i'm glad to see i uh, would love to you know that that was the, after we lost it in 2019 i endured those two years in judiciary with jerry nadler and impeachment and everything else it was just a terrible time as you look ahead, if, if a listener across the country is saying, okay, I'm, all right, I'm thinking about this, I want to vote for my Republican, I want, I, I want to, to House to go back to the Republicans, from an armed services perspective, and you being chairman of armed services, what are the things that you would like to accomplish, say, next year, going into the NDAA process, going into looking at it from a Republican perspective? What are those things that you want to focus on um, and Republicans focus on, especially when it comes to armed services in this next Congress? I want to be a little more aggressive when it comes to, to funding the military. Uh, you know, right now the Democrats are in the majority in both chambers and they have control of the White House. And it's not as high a priority for them as it is for us. They, they really want to put a higher premium on, on domestic spending. Uh, we have a very, very dangerous world, and it's going to take or take Reagan-like spending years for us to get our military modernized. We've been at war for two decades. We've worn everything we got out. But more importantly, we have, we have to transform. We just, we just talked about the Space Force as being a, there to fight in a new war domain. Cyber is a new domain that we've got to be prepared for. We've got all sorts of unmanned platforms that we've got to develop. We've got AI that's going to be a big factor. This is transformative and it's going to be expensive, but we really don't have a choice because China is the pacing threat and they're doing all these things. They're building a massive Navy with enormously capable submarines. We have to stay in front of that. 
and it's going to take a lot of aggressive spending. So that's kind of my number one priority. And then a, a collateral thing I'd like to do is once we're control of the House and Senate and the appropriations bill process, I'd like to throw some water on some of that social indoctrination you referenced a little while ago. Uh, the president can want them to do it, but that doesn't mean we have to fund it. Uh, and if we're in charge, we won't be funding it. That is it. Well, folks, I mean, Mike, I think as you look at the military, the, one of the things is I sort of leave this topic and I think coming into it, uh, as someone who's still in the military, and I know there's a lot of, of, you hear from them all the time, especially in your position, it's been a tough few years for those folks in the military, the pandemic and then the vaccine mandates and, and other things coming up. Um, is there going to be a lot of emphasis too on, on what we'll call uh, self-care or helping our, our members, especially our active duty and our reservists who've been called to do a lot more than the reserve. We, we, I, the reserve force is not what it was in is being not used the way it's intended. It's not a strategic uh, reserve force. It's an active, it's a part of the, of the, of active. Uh, is that something else you'll see from the, the, in under your chairmanship is dealing with those kind of issues? Yeah. And, and this is a bipartisan concern, I, but I, I've, I've made it a priority with my staff. I want to look at the entire compensation component and quality of life for our service members uh, what I've just described is not only going to be a professional military, but we're going to be a highly technical military in the future. We may be a little bit smaller, but it's going to be a much higher caliber of service member. And that, and if you want to attract people like that, you've got to compensate them accordingly. But you've also got to provide a quality of life that makes their family want to be in the professional military. And we have, particularly when it comes to enlisted personnel, done a very poor job of, of addressing that. And, and that is going to become a real priority. I've, I've talked a lot about that with the secretary, the deputy secretary, as well as each of the service chiefs. We all agree we've got a lot of, of work to do, and it's going to take several years for us to get where we need to be. But we're all committed to really increasing the compensation, the health benefits, and the overall quality of life for service members so that they do want to come and spend a career uh, protecting this nation. Well, that's the biggest issue we've got right now is, is in the military is our service members and, and the, you know, their longevity. Some are getting out, some are not coming in. Recruitment issues are a problem. There's a lot of things there. So I think addressing that is going to be, it's going to be paramount. Uh, no matter who's in that chair, I'm glad to sit, know that you'll be in that chair uh, barring uh, nothing going wrong in November, which right now it looks very good as we go forward. And people can know that Mike Rogers has the, uh, the back of the service member. And I think that's, and, from, and I think, you know, as you look at it from a nonpartisan perspective, these are the ones at the tip of the spear, keeping us safe. Um, and, and I think they're having the equipment and the, and then, but also the home life and the base life and the compensation to keep them there is something that is vitally important uh, as we go forward. Mike, we could talk a long time. I'll have you back on another time. I wanted to get a good feel, let people get a good feel of you and also the, what's going on in our Armed Services Committee. Uh, I want to probably have you back maybe a little bit later in the summer to go into the NDA a little bit more, talk about what it means, especially in dealing with how we confront uh, Russia, which has been severely degraded. We haven't had a chance to talk about that today. Um, China's aggression, the nine lines issue, those kind of things going forward. But Mike, thanks for your friendship. Thanks for being a part of the podcast today. And I look forward to having you with our listeners again soon. Glad to be with you. Hey, everybody. I just want to talk about sleep. You know why I want to talk about sleep? It's because I just got out from underneath my, my pillow bed sheets and my pillow that I keep under my head every night because I like to sleep on my side. I like to sleep on my back. I like to sleep, you know, I move at night and my pillow is just the best thing that goes under my head. It keeps me uh, getting restful sleep. The sheets are amazing. It's just what you need. Everybody understands you need seven hours of sleep. Why not sleep in some of the best products out there? And Mike and the folks at my pillow are great folks to do this with. And you can go to mypillow.com or you can call them at 800 564 8475. You'd code word Collins, C O L L I N S. You won't want to miss this. If you have not got the, the these Giza uh, bed sheets, you need them. They're amazing. They're soft. They don't wear out. You need those to that get that sleep against your body at night and provide that cooling, uh, just soothing nature that lets you get the most sleep. 
But you know, they're not just about bed uh, sheets and pillows. They also have the My Slippers. Uh, amazing. I don't wear, I've talked to you about it before. I don't wear slippers, but I do wear My Slippers. They're amazingly comfortable. You can wear them outside. You can wear them inside. Great products. You've got uh, towels. You've got all kinds of stuff. Go to MyPillow.com. It's spring cleaning time. It's spring time to get out there and try and buy new things. Replace some of your old stuff. You'll want to replace your towels. Get some other uh, products for your bedroom all at MyPillow.com, MyPillow.com, or call 800-564-8475. Use the promo code Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. When you check out, I guarantee you will be satisfied.